Jesus? I know it was Jesus. Hey. <laughs> Muy buenas noches. <laughs> Señoras y señores, y bienvenido al Centro de Arte de Occidental. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome, welcome to the uh, Occidental Center for the Arts. And we have uh, a very uh, exciting program lined up for you tonight. That was just the beginning. <laughs> you know, and uh, I'd like to say that welcome to all the people who have driven a long distance to be here. And, and welcome to my friends in Occidental. You know, Occidental is my hometown. I lived here for 15 years and loved it. And I come back here every week on Thursdays to teach a Qigong class over here at St. Philip's on Thursday mornings. So tonight, you know, let me just say something about the program. Uh, first of all, you know, today is International Women's Day. I believe it started in 1917 in, in Russia, and today it's practiced, uh, observed all over the world. You know, in some countries have made it a, a national holiday. And I thought, in, in keeping in that the theme, I found this out today. You know, as uh, the United Nations theme for 2013 International Women's Day is. A promise is a promise. It's time for action and end the violence against women. So in keeping with that, you know, I thought tonight uh, I would read a couple of scenes from my stories, uh, Cigar City stories, uh, where women are involved and uh, and all the women in these stories that I wrote are strong women. A short scene from uh, uh, the story that's called New Baby. New Baby. This is set in uh, approximately around 1945, and the main characters are uh, Paco and Rita, the father and the mother, and the two children, uh, Jorge, and Carmen, you know. And Jorge is the narrator of this story. <clears throat> I'm sitting on the edge of my parents' double bed reading my birth certificate, newly found in a shoebox under the bed, buried among old photos, clippings, and faded Christmas cards. It certifies that I was born alive <laughs> in Hillsborough County, Tampa, Florida, at 1.27 p.m. on November the 21st, 1937. In the blank labeled color or race, someone had scribbled the word white. It also tells me that my father, Francisco Gonzalez, 39, a cigar maker for 23 years, was born in Cuba. And then my mother, Margarita Yanis, 37, born in Tampa, does housework at home. This is a yellowed photostat of the original certificate on file with the state. The fuzzy signature at the bottom reads, Josefina Valenti, midwife. She had also delivered my sister Carmen two years early, earlier on the same bed. Josefina, a former nun, immigrated to Ybor City in the 1920s together with many families from the Magazzolo Valley in Sicily. Most of them got work in the scar factories, but using skills she learned as a nurse, Josefina built a thriving business delivering babies for an affordable fee that included pre- and postnatal care. She lives close by. And I often see her in a white nurse's uniform and cap marching to the home of some lucky couple. She carries a black leather satchel like a doctor's on all her calls. After her visit, 
a baby usually appears in the household. I used to think that she brought the babies in that mysterious black bag. <laughs> On hot summer evenings after dinner, our family sits on the long porch that stretches across the front of our faded yellow house that had been a moonshine distillery during Prohibition. Avocados, papayas grow in the backyard. A huge mango tree shades the bedrooms from the intense heat, and brick pilings lift the house above the hot sands. We greet neighbors strolling past, and everyone is talking about the end of the war or Roosevelt's passing. Carmen and I spend the evening playing games of imagination and make-believe. What's your favorite hero, Jorge? She asks, shooing mosquitoes from her bare legs. I want to be like Robin and live in a cave with Batman and share a life of crime fighting. <laughs> Not me, says Carmen. I want to be strong like Wonder Woman and beat up all the guys. You know. <laughs> Father puffs away at his cigar, leans back in his wicker rocking chair. Mother crochets in silence. Most nights she tells us stories that she makes up as she goes along. But tonight she has a distant look in her eyes. She turns to my father. Papa, we have to talk. He puts, she puts down her needle and thread. Carmen and Jorge, go inside. It's almost bedtime. No, let them stay, querida. I want no secrets in this house. OK, you may not want to hear this, Paco, but I'm six months pregnant. The baby is due in July. Impossible, he says. You can't be pregnant at your age, and we don't need another mouth to feed. It's true, mi amor, she wipes her eyes. I've been to see Josefina. She thinks it will be another boy. He snuffs his cigar and places it on the handrail. I'm going to bed now. Tomorrow we can talk about resolving this situation. <laughs> Buenas noches, Rita. Carmen is overjoyed by the news. I hate it. I will no longer be El Benito in our family and will have this screaming little boy to look after. I walk to the far end of the porch and hang over the railing. Carmen presses her ear to my mother's stomach to see if she can hear the baby sloshing around. My father learned the art of cigar making in Cuba. By the age of 22, he was working as a finisher the person who gives each cigar its final form and wrapper. In Ybor City, he's one of the top finishers at Perfecto Garcia. At the end of the workday, Father stashes a few unfinished cigars into his shirt, takes them home to smoke or give to his friends. On paydays, he sells the communist daily worker on the factory steps. Most evenings after dinner, he joins his male co-workers at the Cuban club to play dominoes and talk politics. Look, Edida, you must understand. Father reaches for the sugar bowl on the kitchen table. Since the end of the war, more machines are being installed. Last week, 30 workers on my floor were laid off and replaced by cigar-making machines and low-paid women to operate them. Why are you telling me this, Mother asks. I'm telling you this, mi amor, because I could lose my job any day, and I can't get work in America. I don't speak their language. My mother is not someone to fool with. She's an activist and feminist who marched in picket lines during the labor strife of the 30s and led a boycott to protest poor working conditions. Wonder Woman and Robin crawl under the house and lie on their backs in the sand underneath the kitchen floor. It would not be fair to bring a child into this uncertain situation. He pauses. 
I don't want you to have this baby. My sister in Havana can take you to a doctor who will fix this. It's safe and legal. Fix me, she laughs, but I'm not broken. I'm just doing what women do naturally, have babies. She walks to the refrigerator. I don't know why I got pregnant so close to menopause. But this unformed soul inside my body is taking a chance with me and deserves to see the light of day. Please thank your sister. Her footsteps echo down the long hallway and out the front door. Thank you. Uh, this takes place mostly on a streetcar. On the streetcar, yes. And uh, uh, probably around 1945, you know, Christmas time, single mother and her two children are going Christmas shopping. That's the setting for this story. And uh, the narrator for this story is the little boy, the young boy. And I forget his name. <laughs> Here we go. I point my brownie Hawkeye camera at my mother and sister, who stand arm in arm on the sidewalk next to the streetcar tracks. They smile. I snap. Mother is wearing a white cotton, low-cut dress with a wide-brimmed hat, and she looks like Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind. My sister Anita is in dungarees and a baggy t-shirt to hide her fully formed boobs. I've seen them. She's captain of the high school softball team, and we're going downtown one week before Christmas to buy her a uniform. I'm getting a pair of gym shorts and a jock strap for PE class. I hate shopping. I especially hate shopping with my mother. She gets into arguments over the price or the service or asks to see the manager. She is always embarrassing me. The noon streetcar glides to a stop just past 22nd Street, 20 minutes late. All the passengers get off and scatter in every direction. This local streetcar sh line shuttles back and forth between Ybor City and downtown Tampa. The motorman closes the door, lowers the trolley, and secures it to the hook. Then he heads for the Columbia restaurant across the street. Where are you going, mister? My mother yells from the sidewalk. Me and my kids need to get downtown, and we're already a half hour late. Forgive me, senora, but nature calls. I have to relieve myself first. His eyes scan my mother head to toe. You want to give me a hand? He touches his crotch. Get your mother to give you a hand, you worm, and please show more respect. I may be a widow, but I'm not a whore. He howls in laughter and darts through the swinging doors into the cantina. Ma, why is that man laughing? Anita asks. Because he's stupid. That's right. <laughs> like most men. <laughs> Mama, can we get on the streetcar? I want to drive it. I tug on her dress. If that idiot can drive a streetcar, son, <coughs> anybody can. His name is Raul. He dated my cousin, Dora. She said he's a lousy lover and belongs to the clan. <laughs> Raul returns carrying a glass of café con leche and boards the streetcar. Passengers crowd at the door. Anita and I get on first. My mother trips on the top step and Raul jumps from his seat to catch her, but she pushes him away. I don't need your help, Mr. Conductor. I am sorry for the delay, madam, but I... Had I known what a beautiful woman you are, I would have rushed to get you downtown. Stash it, mister. I'm not interested in dwarfs. <laughs> she drops the money into the coin box and asks for three transfers. I'm sorry, senora, but that's not a dime, it's a penny. He smiles and stares at my mother's breasts. 
She peers into the glass coin box. What do you mean, not a dime? That's right. It's one of those new 1943 pennies made out of zinc. The copper is needed to fight the war against the Japs. This capitalist war will be the ruin of us all. She pays the fare. Remember Pearl Harbor, he chimes in. My sister and I run down the wood plank aisles past dozens of passengers and take seats on the near the rear of the car. Anita sits astride two seats with one foot propped up on the windowsill. I sit behind her on the aisle. In the viewfinder of my tiny camera, the inside of the car looks like a spaceship. Brass fittings and steel bars on the windows, teakwood molding and rattan seats. Mother follows us to the rear of the car. Anita, sit up straight and cross your legs. She takes off her hat. Her long auburn hair spills to her shoulders. I'll make a young lady out of you yet. She sits down next to Anita, kicks off her shoes, and sighs. I'm sorry, senora, but you can't sit there. Raul speaks into the rearview mirror. My mother doesn't move. You can't sit there, madam. That's the color section. White passengers must sit at the front of the car. <coughs> Do I look white to you? A few of the Negro passengers turn around and look at her. For all you know, Romeo, I'm not white. Two colored ladies roll their eyes. I could be a mulatta or an octoroon. Look, lady, I don't care if you're an octopus. This street car is not moving until you and the children get into the white section. In Florida, all public facilities are segregated. Water fountains for whites only, others for coloreds, white toilets, black toilets, Restaurants serve only whites in the dining room. Colors can buy food only at the back window. And passengers on public buses and streetcars are seated according to race. These folks are just as good as us, Raul. Why should they have to sit in the back of the streetcar? How do you know my name? I'm Christina, Dora's cousin. Dora! Oh my God, a vision of heaven, his eyes glaze over. I miss her so much. He runs to the front, trips the magneto switch, and the streetcar begins to move. You can stay there for now, Cristina, but when we get to 15th Street, you have to move up to the front or take another department store across the street. They sell almost anything you want. Clothes, shoes, camping and fishing gear, army surplus and jeans. When I was in the fourth grade, I tried to sell Mrs. Buckman a ticket to the school's May Festival. Can colored people go there? She asked me. No, I don't think so, but you're not colored. Yes, I am. I'm a Jew. The streetcar crosses 15th Street and slams to a sudden stop in front of Las Novedades. Raul dropped the brake too soon. Standing passengers swing on their straps and grumble as they disembark to connect with other streetcar and bus lines. Only two Negro women wearing almost identical feathered hats now remain in the car with the three of us. Raul combs his hair, puts on his motorman's jacket, and marches down the aisle to where we sit. He looks taller in uniform, his face fixed in a frown. I take a flash picture of him in his cowboy books. He blinks. Listen, Cristina, move to the front right now or get off. His body is stiff, his shoulder back. The two Negro women leave quietly by the front door. I could lose my job over your bullshit. I'm not moving anywhere, big boy. <laughs> you guys in uniform think you own this country, but you're wrong. 
When working class people like me stand up for their rights, you'll be left behind, naked and without a badge. She crosses her legs, looks out the window. My sister and I sink into our seats. <laughs> That's it, Christina. I've heard enough of your communist bullshit. I'm calling the police. He picks up the coin box and leaves the car, but sticks his head back in. People like you belong in camps, he yells. Fascist pig, my mother snarls, standing at mid-aisle, hands on the hip. Raul's face turns deep red. He turns. He runs to the Ritz Theater to use the payphone and leaves the car doors open. The motor running and the trolley engaged. I think I'll pause there. <laughs> Do any of you writers out there who have not read this want to take a guess at what happens next? Uh, <laughs> we'll have to buy the book. <laughs> I will read a one more half page, okay? But, but I just want to know if anybody has any bright ideas as now what are they going to do? Now what are they going to do? You know, when I'm writing, a lot of times I'll get to a place, you know, where there's a knock at the door. I have no idea who's there, you know. Usually I stop there, you know, and I'll go do Tai Chi. And usually when I'm doing Tai Chi, a lot of ideas come up, you know. It's like, I really believe, you know, that for me, the best material comes from the unconscious. The best things I've ever written, you know, came from someplace else, it wasn't me, you know. And in order to get to that place, you know, I have to do something else with my body, get out of my head, you know, and start doing some movement, you know, scrub the floor, do the dishes, whatever, you know, and then it comes, and then it comes. So, okay, I'll read you what happens. <laughs> so where were we? Here we are. Uh, yeah. He goes to use the payphone, leaves the car doors open, the motor running, and the trolley engaged. My mother dashes to the front of the car, drops into the motorman's seat. She pulls the lever to close the door, raises the block brakes, sounds the horn, and the car inches forward silently, propelled only by gravity. <laughs> Mother, what are you doing? Are you crazy, Anita? Yes, you'll get us killed. No, I won't, darling. All I have to do is follow the tracks. <laughs> she flips the magneto, pushes the throttle, and nothing happens. She slams it with her fist, and the streetcar lunges forward, travels west on 7th Avenue at a fast clip. Way to go, Mom! This is really fun. Can I drive now? <laughs> Not yet, son. Let me get the hang of this first, all right? I snap a photo of her at the controls. She looks at the camera and smiles and clangs the bell. We glide past Avenida República de Cuba, 13th Street, 12th Street. Jay Walkers scatter over at the sound of the horn and the speeding streetcar. We run the red light at 11th Street. Please slow down, Mom. I'm scared, Anita whispers. At Nebraska Avenue, the tracks make a sharp left turn. The streetcar hits the curb too fast and leans to the right. The wheels leave the rails and slice across the pavement, creating a wave of sparks. The trolley jumps the wire and the pole flaps around like an injured cobra, zapping everything it strikes. <laughs> One of the motors catches fire, and a plume of smoke <laughs> rises above the rooftops just as a squadron of police cars arrives on the scene. <laughs> Thank you.
And, and uh, the last, uh, like I said, uh, seven of the pieces in here are uh, short stories in uh, literary style, fictional form with dialogue and characters and all that stuff, you know. And the last two pieces are more poetic in form, but they're still stories. And the one I'm going to read is called Ebor Dreaming, Ebor Dreaming, and uh, <coughs> here we go. <clears throat> I drift down palm-lined avenues, past backyards ripe with avocados, papayas, and guavas. I savor a cognac in a cafe solo with cigar makers who roll the finest Havanas in the world. I see electric streetcars swoosh down La Setima to Palmetto Beach and Ballast Point. I order a press sandwich thin slices of Spanish ham, roast pork, and cheese on Cuban bread at the Silver Dollar Cafe. I hear fishermen hawk their catch to housewives in shotgun houses with small porches, where workers sit in the evening and sing Cuban boleros and Argentine tangos. I awake to the aroma of coffee roasting at La Naviera, bread baking at Alessi's brick oven, and devil crabs steaming at Miranda's. I hear the blast of ship's whistles at the Ebor docks, unloading bananas and sea turtles. I dance to the Caribbean rhythm of bongos, timbales and congas, six trumpets and a bank of saxophones at the Cuban club. Mambos, rumbas, and cha-chas excite my blood. I cruise down 7th Avenue in pressed khakis to meet the right girl, treat her to a hot Cuban sandwich at Cuervos, a pastel de piña at Las Novedades, or a mango sherbet at Los Elamos. I see my parents, uncles, and cousins lose their jobs to cigar-making machines installed after the war. Families move away, children flee town, and never come back. I awake to the thunder of bulldozers storming across the landscape to make room for an interstate. Only brick factories and social clubs remain in a sea of empty lots dotted with fruit trees. I mourn those years of neglect and decay and boarded up storefronts and crime-infested streets, but Ybor City survives and comes back as a tattooed tart, luring rowdies to a drink and raise hell in dark bars that serve singles, bikers, gays, and blacks. I watch semi-nude dancers gyrate to disco music in front of Goya's murals. I see a gay bathhouse on the same block where I played hopscotch and jump rope. A 20-screen multiplex eclipses El Centro Español where we dance to the orchestras of Perez Prado and Tito Fuentes. I return to my dream and stand on the corner of 15th Street and 7th Avenue and see you, radiant and alive again. I hear hot salsa rhythms pouring from wrought iron balconies, trolleys screeching at the turn, and the shuttle of chaveta knives trimming tender tobacco leaves. I smell the spicy aroma of Spanish bean soup and see waiters carrying two-gallon pots of steaming coffee to the cigar makers in the galleries where lectors stand on platforms and read Cervantes and Tolstoy to the workers. Ibor of my dreams, I miss you.